Hey guys, it's Adrian. Just a quick reminder to sign up for our launch team for our pageant review site at pageantlaunch.com. We're looking to make the pageant industry safe, transparent, and fair. Three things which I know you agree are super, super important. So head over to pageantlaunch.com, enter your email address. It's completely free. Let's get you to our live. Hey everyone, it's Adrian from The Pageant Project and I have Nazir Wadi, I've been practicing saying your name several times, <laughs> Nazir, um, who is Miss Earth South Africa 2018 slash 19. Nazir, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely amazing to be here and an honor to be speaking to you. Well, as I, I've said um, on multiple occasions, you're the first South African queen that I've interviewed. So why don't we start with uh, South Africa? And um, as I mentioned to uh, Nazia, I have her Miss Earth South Africa video here. So what I thought I'd do, because if you're like me and you've never seen South Africa, you need to see this video. It goes, how long is it, Nazia? It's about three minutes? Yeah, about three minutes. Okay, so I'll keep us on screen, but what I'll do through the wonders of modern technology, I'll play this video and then you guys, let me get rid of the actual branding as well. And if you haven't watched one of my interviews before, if you, ha uh, before, if you have any questions for Nazia, put them in the comments and I'll pass them on to her. She'll be able to read your comments on screen. But um, let's play this video and you get to see um, some of South Africa, some of the things that I've never seen before. Here we go. Hello. I am Nazia Wadi. I am 22 years old and I hail from the beautiful and diverse rainbow nation, South Africa. I hold a bachelor's degree in international relations and media studies. I have recently completed my honors degree in media. I am from the glittering city of gold, Johannesburg, in the province of Gauteng. I grew up in the small town on the south of Johannesburg called Lanasia. My South Africa is a vibrant, diverse and unique country situated on the southern tip of the African continent, surrounded by the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. South Africa is home to a diverse people, ranging from various cultures. I too have a variety of cultures embedded in me. Our diversity is expressed in our 11 official languages. South Africa is rich in natural heritage and is the third most biodiverse country in the world, marked by a variety of ecosystems, beautiful landscapes and ranging climates. South Africa is a prime ecotourism destination, being home to eight terrestrial biomes, 19 national parks, the Table Mountain, which is one of the natural wonders of the world, and floral kingdoms that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Our floral kingdom is home to our national flower, the Protea. The Protea traditionally represents change and hope. The Protea is a beautiful, strong, resilient and unique flower that can survive without water for a long period of time. The Protea reminds me of my mother, who raised me single-handedly through her strength, beauty and resilience. The Protea also reminds me of the strength, beauty and resilience of the South African people who were able to overcome the adversity of apartheid, bringing hope and change to the beautiful rainbow nation we have today. Some of my other projects include fundraising for the Flamingo Project that supported a rehabilitation center in my province. As Miss Earth South Africa, I drive the campaign called Hashtag Waste Stops With Me. This campaign advocates through community cleanups, tree plantings and school visits to educate children on the importance of the five R's. I also work alongside the Department of Environmental Affairs on their Good Green Deeds national campaign my work in the community awarded me with a Woman of Wonder Award and a second place in the Nelson Mandela Community Youth Leadership Awards. We cannot separate environmental and social issues. Therefore, my advocacy includes people and planet, which focuses on addressing our ill waste management habits and plastic pollution, which I believe are the single greatest threats to Mother Earth. Through awareness projects and education, we can truly combat climate change. I would like to be the next Miss Earth because like my beautiful South African people and our Protea, I am strong, passionate and resilient and I would like to be the Protea of Mother Earth. My name is Nazia Wadi 
Miss Earth South Africa, and I am a woman on the earth. Hello, I am. Nazia, that's an amazing, um, that's an amazing video. How does it feel for yourself watching it back? I mean, you would have shot it what about a year ago? Yes, exactly a year ago. I mean, um, my mom and I were having this conversation yesterday. And yesterday was actually the day that I flew out of South Africa to go to the Philippines. And I think seeing this video again is so nostalgic. I just, I remember, I'm reminded of all the long hours and the hard work um, it took to put this video together um, and to make sure we got it in time, done for the deadline that we needed to submit our eco videos. But it, it was just so much fun bringing this together. And I think the hardest part for me with this video is that there's so many interesting things about South Africa. I had to chop and change my, my video so many times to make sure that it wasn't too long. But it's such a nostalgic experience. And uh, just what I think this is the first time I'm watching it again since probably last year. So it's, it's good also to see how much I've grown since then. I think that's one of the things that really stand out for me. Uh, now, Giselle Ace, who I'm interviewing, I believe on Thursday, I think, Wednesday or Thursday, Giselle, sorry, I can't remember, I don't have my calendar in front of me. Um, well, she hasn't written words, she's just put emojis there, so she's saying hello. I see um, that, thank you. Nazia, you mentioned that it would be difficult, it was difficult to sort of pick what to put into that video. I imagine were you given sort of a maximum of about three minutes? I mean, you couldn't have gone like 10 minutes or 20 minutes, could you? Yes, that's right. I mean, we were given that deadline of three minutes. And I mean, I think my first voice recording, because I, I did a voice recording first so that I could do the voice on top of the video. And I think yeah. the first voice recording was like seven minutes. And my mom was like, um, I got bored halfway. I think, I think seven minutes <laughs> is way too long. I think you need to you need to catch people's attention and do it quicker. So from seven minutes, we got back down to three. I know exactly how it feels because I helped one of our Australian queens shoot her video for Australia, obviously, oh, cool. for a tourism pageant. And her initial voiceover was like twice as long as it was allowed to be. But going back to the reason I really wanted to show that video is, I mean, the country looks absolutely stunning. I mean, I'm sure some of that is is stock footage and what have you, but it, you mentioned the difficulty of choosing what to show. And I have this, a similar difficulty when it comes to Australia. I mean, people know the Opera House, for example, the Harbour yes, Bridge, exactly. they probably know about kangaroos, but you also want to show something that is more Australian than just a tourist destination. So how did you go about narrowing down, I don't know if that's the right word, but narrowing down an entire country that's as diverse as South Africa into three minutes? How did you make that choice? It was, re it was really a difficult, um, a difficult task and it took us quite a while to get that finished piece that you've just seen now. Um, I think in terms of choosing the imagery, I didn't want to choose imagery that someone from international countries might have already seen before. I wanted to choose footage that they might not have seen before or might not have associated with South Africa before. Um, so I tried to kind of steer away from the stereotypical pictures that you'd see of South Africa. I think one of the images we also used there was of an informal settlement as well in South Africa to show the diverse array of what you would see in South Africa, our beautiful nature, our beautiful cities, and also the little more sensitive part of our country as well, where we're struggling a little bit in terms of mm. um, our housing problems and the informal settlements that you would see all around South Africa as well. So if, let's say I was to go to South Africa and I've, I've never been before, what are the things that you would put on my absolute you know, must see list if I had, let's say, a week or two, um, or let's say a month to, to really experience what the real South Africa is, versus let's say just what the tourist destinations would be? I think the best way to understand South Africa, our country and where we are, as opposed to where we've come from, I'm from Johannesburg. So I'm going to pick places in Johannesburg that I think 
would really help you understand South Africa and our people and what we've been through. Um, I would definitely suggest the um, Constitutional Court and what we call Constitutional Hill, which is a prison that was used during the apartheid time to imprison um, freedom fighters during that time. Um, visiting the prison gives you a very good idea about how people of different colors were treated in South Africa during apartheid, whether you were black, whether you were white, whether you were considered Indian by the apartheid government. And just to kind of get an experience of how horribly these people were treated. And what is amazing that has stemmed out of this place is that our constitutional court is actually set on the same, um, on the same area as the Constitutional Hill Prison. And oh, wow. it shows, it's a beautiful kind of idea of showing somebody where we've come from and where we are now. And as a lot of people know, our constitution is one of the most diverse and inclusive constitutions all around the world. That would be the first place I would definitely suggest you go to. The other place here in South Africa, in Johannesburg particularly, is Vilakazi Street. Vilakazi Street is an amazing place to visit. It is, you'll be able to go and visit Nelson Mandela's home, which is an amazing thing to go and see. You'll also be able to see the site of the Soweto uprising, the youth Soweto uprising, where children in the area and from all over Johannesburg came together to protest against um, the for enforcement of using Afrikaans as a main language, which most South Africans didn't speak at the time. It was your main mm -hmm. language of learning. And kids from all over came together in this particular area to protest. And it was, it was also where the incredible and oh, heartbreaking massacre occurred where police brutality was evident in the day where they were shooting children, where the famous pictures were taken. You can really understand the strength and resilience of even South African youth, that they were showing, showing people how South Africans were standing up and fighting against the system of apartheid. So you actually get to visit all those sites where the massacre took place and where the uprising, the student uprising actually took place. That would definitely be another another place that you should definitely visit. And in Johannesburg as well, even though we are a city, I think there isn't anybody who, want, who comes to South Africa without going on a safari. So we have mm -hmm. an amazing array of national parks for you to visit so you can understand and view our, our incredible wildlife and our incredible flora and fauna in, in Johannesburg. So these are just like three main places I would definitely say you would have to visit. It would show you the amazing wildlife and nature that we have to offer in South Africa, as well as a good, it gives you a good understanding of who, who we are as South African people mm. and all the adversities we've had to overcome to be where we are today. Now, just can you pronounce that name for me? Obviously, I'm assuming it's someone that's related to you. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. How do you pronounce that? Uh, which one? Uh, the one below. Fai, is it Faiza? Faiza Wadi. Yes, that's my mom, actually. <laughs> okay. I thought it might be. So, hello, mom. Thanks for watching. She sent you three love hearts. Oh, thank you, mom. Thanks for always being there to support. Uh, and I, I did want to, I will ask you about your mom. I just want to backtrack for a second. Um, I don't think we can talk, at least from my perspective, about South Africa without mentioning Nelson Mandela, as you've mentioned. Of course, yes. Um, I think about five years, five or ten years ago, they did a poll of uh, corporate corporates around the world, and they asked who was the most trusted person in the world. And Nelson Mandela came in at number one. And actually, Roger Federer, the tennis player, who does have South African <laughs> heritage as well, he yes, came in at number exactly. two. So there must be something to South Africa there. But um, apartheid, and obviously it's not not a practice anymore. But I do want to ask: Has it left? I mean, I'm sure it's left some marks on the on the culture, and it's as you mentioned, it's sort of maybe the the past that South Africa is not so proud of, but that you've built on. How has apartheid sort of left its mark on South Africa now? I definitely think that it's shaped who we are today 
and it's made us more conscious of the different cultures that are around us. I mean, South Africa is an incredibly diverse country. We have people from an array of religious, cultural, and racial backgrounds who call South Africa home and can trace their heritage in South Africa for more than 100 years. So I think um, the lesson of apartheid has definitely made us who we are. It's made us more conscious of conscious and tolerant of other cultures, other racial groups, and other religions in our country. And it definitely has also left a lot of um, trauma and emotional scars mm. on us as a people and as a country. I mean, for, for a very long time, apartheid prevailed over South Africa. And um, there are a lot of people who are still alive in South Africa who can who can vouch for their experiences or their horrible experiences um, during apartheid. And what it also has done for a lot of communities in South Africa is that it's still left people in very difficult circumstances and difficult positions where a lot of people are still in poverty. Um, a lot of people are still struggling from um, the scars of the past. Uh, for example, I come from um, a small township in the south of Johannesburg called Venasia, and it was the Group Areas Act of, of the apartheid regime that separated three areas. If there's actually an intersection on the highway where you can actually see the different areas that people were separated into, where black people were put in Soweto and people of Indian origin were put in an area called Venasia, which is where I grew up. And at this intersection at the highway, you can still see that division. I mean, since apartheid, we have mixed and mingled and there are different people living in those areas now and more um, a more div diverse array of people who are living in those areas. But the scars are still very much there. There are yeah. so many disadvantaged communities in South Africa that are still suffering at the hands of what they experienced um, during apartheid. I mean, I've been to schools all over the country. And one particular school that I'm reminded of in East London, um, the school is in a very remote, very rural area in South Africa. So they don't always receive a lot of visitors or a lot of assistance in that particular area. And I think that was the hardest day for me. I was so heartbroken. I mean, the kids in that school still don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, Wow. I think what the system was at the school was that there would be a bucket of water outside each class for drinking and a bucket of water outside the bathroom for washing your hands. And I mean, these were very, very little kids, um, probably yeah. between the ages of seven and 12 years old. And for me to see that this kind of poverty um, still exists in our country is extremely heartbreaking. And it still shows that we are still even though it's been so many years after our liberation, there's still so much work that needs to be done in order to level the playing field, make sure that we all have equal access to our basic needs. So I think that was a prime example of the scars of apartheid are still very much there and they're not very difficult to find either. That unfortunately is not surprising to me at all. Um, can you describe what Nelson Mandela, not just the person, but as a figure, what he meant to you and what the reaction was when he passed away? Um, I remember the day that he passed away very, very clearly. Um, I remember being at home with my mum and it was the most gut-wrenching feeling in the world. And I was born in the year 1997, which was a couple of years after our liberation. And what Nelson Mandela means for me is that during apartheid, I would have been discriminated against. I wouldn't have had not even half or of the opportunities that I'm able to have today. So as a young person born post our liberation struggle, for me, all I feel about um, Nelson Mandela is sheer gratitude. It's because of figures like him that I have the possibilities and the options and the opportunities that I have today. And all his sacrifices are what gave me these opportunities and these kind of freedoms that I enjoy today. So I, am, I feel extreme gratitude 
and extreme respect for someone like him mm. because it is because of figures like him and many other um, freedom fighters who fought for the freedom that I enjoy today. And that's, that's just how I feel. I mean, it was the most gut-wrenching experience um, hearing about his passing. And the first thing we did was mom and I took some candles and some flowers and we went to Nelson Mandela's house and there were maybe hundreds of people who were there that yeah. evening just to pay their respect. And I mean, we were a country in mourning. This was not just a hero for mm. South Africa or role model for South Africa, but I think for the world at large, he's someone that everybody looked up to. Yeah. And I think for me, the biggest lesson he's taught the world in South Africa is forgiveness. He, Absolutely. I mean, we could have very well been a country on the verge of a civil war after our liberation. And he taught us that very important lesson of forgiveness. I mean, the, the one thing that sticks with me about Nelson Mandela is that when he was released from prison, he was incarcerated for, I believe, around two decades and he's released from that prison and you would understand why he would come out after that having been incarcerated for 20 20 years and then he'd want to kill every white person but he didn't do that he instead decided to try to bring everyone together and reconcile the country so your point about forgiveness it's i mean what he did was amazing which i guess is why he's as you said so respected around the world um you did also, speaking of sacrifice, you did mention your mother as well. So can you tell us a little bit about your mother and um, what she's meant to you during your young life? My mum is, my mum is everything to me. Um, we are best friends. It's basically been the two of us against the world from as long as I can <laughs> remember. Um, she's, literally my best friend. Uh, I talk to her about boys, about everything. I mean, we can, we can, we can sit over having a, some ice cream or popcorn and having a conversation pretty much about anything. And I think of all the people in my life, she's inspired me the most. Um, my parents got divorced when I was three years old and my mom was a victim of domestic violence and seeing her come out of her struggle so strong and building a life for herself, picking herself up and raising me on, on her own has been the most incredible thing to watch. And she is the most strong, resilient and compassionate woman I've ever met. And mm. to see her overcome such adversity has, and still thrive despite of it has been the most inspiring thing for me. So she has been my role model and my, my, my biggest supporter. And I think seeing her example has made me all the more motivated to be successful or to be the best version of myself. Absolutely. I can understand that. She sounds like an amazing woman. Giselle has asked, well, she said, what a queen. And then she's asked, oh, thank what you. do you love about your country other than its diversity in people and nature? There's a lot of things to, to love about South Africa. And like you said, our diversity and our array of culture is one of the many things that I think a lot of us love about being South African. Um, the one thing that I love most about being South African is that um, our people have shown time and time again that we can overcome adversity when we come together. I think South Africans have the most unique way of coming together and becoming one when we are faced with adversity. And we've seen that over and over again throughout history. And that makes me the most proud to be South African is our ability to be strong, to be resilient and to come together in great times of need. Um, it's something I've always, always admired and been so proud to be South African of it's the one thing that makes me very proud to be South African because it's something that's really embedded in us as a people that irrespective of our differences, we will come together if we are faced with adversity. And I would be remiss if I didn't address, I think it was two days ago and forgive me, I don't exactly remember the day, but was it national heritage day? 
Yes, that's correct. We actually had a long weekend, so we had a nice holiday this weekend because okay. we had Heritage Day on Thursday. Right. So, can you tell me a little bit about what that day is and what it represents? So, because South Africa, as we said before, is so culturally diverse, it's about coming together to celebrate our heritage. And our heritage, I mean, each South African's heritage is different and the same. We're all South African, but a lot of us have um, other cultures embedded in us as well. So it's about coming together, being proud of who we are, not just celebrating us and our culture and our heritage, but our culture and our heritage as South Africans. I think the most fun thing that we do, it's Heritage Day is called Bri Day as well. I'm not sure if you know what that is. No. <laughs> okay, so braai is basically the South African word for barbecue. So it's it's a very traditional, a very South African thing to just have a braai or a barbecue on Heritage Day. It's pretty much part of South African culture. So you'd have, you know, your all your traditional South African foods or and all your traditional South African desserts, and that's how you celebrate Heritage Day. You have a a big braai with all your family. Wow, that that sounds actually quite Australian. To um, you know, the the quintessential it does. phrase. It does. Yeah. Throw throw a shrimp on the barbie. I mean, I in every interview I do because it's with pageant girls, we do end up talking about food. So can you just run me through South African cuisine? What are the interesting aspects, like your favorites or the the in like the delights that no one knows about what what's south african cuisine like south african cuisine is probably exactly what it sounds like it's a melting pot of cultures there's no one particular kind of food that is just south african food um i think a traditional way of cooking or a traditional type of food would be cooking on a on a poiki and a poiki is basically um, a very big steel pot. It's like a slow cooker, so you can put your veg or meat oh. or whatever you'd like inside, and you'd cook it off, cook it in there on an open fire. That's a very traditional, very South African way to cook. Um, another South African dessert that may not be anywhere else in the world is a milk tart. Um, it's very South African, very traditionally South African, I think. Most South Africans really enjoy milk tart. It's um, very much part of South African culture. If you're having a braai, you're probably going to have a milk tart on your table, for sure. Okay. I mean, even in I mean, even Indian food is 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 very much part of South African culture as well. We have something um, that you probably won't find in India, but you'll definitely find it here. It's called a bunny chow. It's basically a a, a half loaf of bread. <laughs> And the inside of the bread has been taken out, and you'd yeah. fill it with um, with a curry, any kind of curry that you'd like, and you'd eat it in this big loaf of bread. So that would also be something that's very, very South African. And bultong, I'm not sure if you are familiar with bultong. That. Bultong is kind of like jerky. Yeah. Yep. So that's very South African as well. The dried um, the dried meat. And South Africans are known for their wine as well. We have um, some of the most amazing um, wineries in Cape Town, actually. So, I mean, there isn't one specific thing that is that I would say this is definitely South African cuisine. South African cuisine is anything from um, Indian food to chisanyama, which is basically um, different kinds of meat or what we'd call pup, which is maize meal that you'd have with, uh, that you'd cook and steam, and you'd have it with some, like a tomato relish on the top. There's so many different mm. cuisines that are part of South African culture, which is very exciting because, um, I mean, we enjoy pretty much any kind of cuisine as South Africans. Yeah. But when you go, let's say, to an international pageant and, you know, you have to bring something that represents your country, I mean, for the Australians, it's very simple. It's usually Vegemite, or I don't know if you know Tim Tam's yeah. chocolate biscuit. But yes, the yeah. thing with Vegemite is I can't even stand Vegemite, even though it's supposed to be Australian. But what, and you know, they, they take koala, stuffed koala, stuffed kangaroos and boomerangs. What do you take over to represent South Africa when it's so diverse? Um, 
So this actually brings me back to my experience in the Philippines. I thought, uh, I mean, I packed a lot of snacks that I would normally like to have at home, um, like a lot of the sour plums and things like that, which I actually found from a lot of the girls in Asia, they have a lot in Asia as well. So they were like, oh, wait, I know this, I know this, I know that. And um, for a lot of the girls who wanted to try, I took quite a bit of bultong with me for them to try. So that was the one thing that I took with me um, for a lot of the girls to try. And I think if I could, um, I mean, milk tarts are really, really delicious. And I don't know if it would be similar to anything the girls would have in other countries. So if I could, I would definitely try to bring that. Right. Okay. I'm fascinated by the idea of these milk tarts. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to look them up afterwards. Let me just go back to the comments. So you have, uh, Neri Cruz. I'll put up her comment. Um, or sorry, Neri, I don't know if that's, if you're a, a guy or girl, but I'll put up your comment. Hi, what was your advocacy as Miss Earth South Africa? And what do you do to continue slash maintain this? Thank you so much for that question. It's a very good question, actually. Um, especially in terms of advocacies, it's not something that you carry with you for just a couple of weeks, but something I believe that you should carry with you all your life. Um, my advocacy during Miss Earth uh, South Africa and now is the hashtag called Waste Stocks With Me. It's basically taking responsibility for your waste taking responsibility of your life and your lifestyle to be kinder to the environment, basically addressing our ill waste management habits and how we can be kinder to the environment. And this was done through community cleanups, school visits, tree plantings to try to create this love and respect for environment within our young children. I, I so firmly believe that young children are the future of our world and our planet. And if we are raising children to be eco-warriors from now, we're going to have a generation of eco-warriors who are going to be taking on all the environmental challenges and looking after our planet. Um, how I'm still living by that, um, COVID-19 has definitely had an impact on the amount of projects and initiatives that I've possibly had the opportunity to be ahead or be part of. But um, Waste Stops With Me is definitely something that's embedded in my lifestyle. From the time I started my Miss Earth journey right up until now, um, basically choosing products that are kinder for the environment. Perhaps if it's certified by Beauty Without Cruelty or if it's packaged in eco-friendly packaging. Making sure that I'm separating my wasted source into paper, plastics, um, making sure I'm recycling as much as possible and just being responsible in that sense in my day-to-day -day life, trying to avoid single-use plastics where I can, finding alternatives for um, waste that I'm perhaps um, accumulating in my home, small things like that. I've always believed that um, being kinder to the environment or um, getting involved or active in environment is as simple as taking these small day-to-day -day steps in and changing your lifestyle to be kinder to in the environment because this, even the smallest action can make the biggest difference. Swapping out your single-use plastic bottles for a reusable option or switching to a more eco-friendly toothbrush, small things like that reduce your waste in massive, massive ways and you are positively contributing to the environment and you are being a responsible, active person in your, in your community or in your space. And starting at home is the best place to be an eco-warrior. So that's how I've kind of continued on with my advocacy as waste stops with me. And obviously, Nazir, you've competed internationally for Miss Earth. So you would have met girls from all corners of the world. I know that you met Susanna, um, who was our queen, you've met Matea, who was Canada's queen, and then I'm sure you've met many, many others. Just from my point of view, South Africa, as you mentioned, sort of the safari and the game, it's always seemed like a country that would be very in touch with the environment, with nature, as maybe Australia is in touch with the beaches and we have the outback. From your experience competing internationally, 
Did you find that maybe South Africa as a whole is more in touch with nature or maybe a bit less in touch with nature than some of the other countries like America or Australia or the UK? I mean, it's, it's always was inspiring to hear about um, some of the other contestants' experiences and some of the projects and initiatives that are going on in other countries. And I think that's what made the international competition the most exciting, is that you find lots of new and exciting ways to get involved or new and exciting ways to really make a bigger difference. And there was a lot of the time where I would listen um, to some of the girls talk about their advocacies or what's going on in their countries. And I'd be like, wow, that's really amazing that this is what these people do. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. I wish we could do this in South Africa. I think it would make such an incredible difference um, mm. for our country or, um, our, uh, or our, our natural heritage, you know, like our wildlife. Um, especially um, hearing a lot from Susanna about a lot of the conservation initiatives that go on in Australia was incredibly inspiring, especially because we are a country that is plagued by um, illegal illegal hunting. Um, yeah. Like our lions are being butchered basically and a lot of our lions are being bred basically for, for hunting, for trophy hunting, um, yeah. which is absolutely heartbreaking. And I do wish that as South Africans, we could be doing a lot more. I mean, I think there isn't anyone around the world who doesn't know the crisis with our lions and our uh, Mm. rhino and um, our elephants as well being killed for ivory or for their horns um, or for or just for sport and yeah. a lot of what I heard about I mean I love watching documentaries about nature and conservation and what's going on all around the world and particularly speaking to Susanna there are so many amazing amazing initiatives that are going on in Australia to really preserve a lot of the wildlife that are unique to your country hmm. and the same for, goes for South Africa is a lot of the wildlife that we have here is very unique to South Africa and it's our job to protect it and I did feel that there is a lot more that we can do um, to educate people about what's really going on in our country and what we can really do to get involved and to make sure that um, we're doing our part in terms of protecting the wildlife that we do have. Um, I have an aunt who lives about two and a half, a two and a half hour drive from where I live. And she started, she's someone who's very passionate about wildlife and about conserving wildlife. And her and her husband actually have a game reserve where they take in a lot of an animals who have been sailed from, who have been saved rather from the illegal wildlife trade or from circuses around the world. And she... Wow basically keeps them in this rehabilitation area and looks after them. Because a lot of them have been so um, so severely um, damaged from their experiences. Like a lot of the lions that come from, uh, who have been rescued from circuses don't have claws or teeth anymore and are unable to fend for themselves in the wild. She would just open up her arms and take them under her care. Um, and I think for us as South Africans and part of our advocacy is to really educate children on the importance of why we need to protect these animals and um, what we can do as, as citizens to make sure we're not supporting these industries um, just to protect who we are. And it is part of who we are. It's very much part of who we are. It's our natural heritage and having these animals we're so blessed to have in our country is it's our duty to protect. And I've seen that a lot in Australia, and I do wish it is something we could be doing more of in South Africa in terms of conservation. Uh, now, Giselle here, remind me, Nazia, what's the word for barbecue? Is it bray? Bray? It's a bray. Bray. A bray. She, she's, she's here, said bray, that she loves it. Um, in, you mentioned that the, in your video, all the way back to the beginning of our interview, there are 11 official languages and Giselle was educating me on some of them. Just off the top of your head, are you actually able to even list the 11 official languages? Because in Australia, we have one, English. You have 11. How, how many of the 11 can you actually name? So um, everyone in South Africa 
speaks English relatively well. So English is a lot of the time like our base language so that we can all communicate with each other because I think it's very easy to get confused. I, I, re I realized this a lot when I was overseas and the girls would ask me, okay, I saw your eco video and I would kind of get the same mm. response. 11 official languages. So you're telling me that South Africans walk in the street and nobody understands a thing that anyone says. How do you communicate? <laughs> So a lot of people in South Africa are multilingual and can speak more than one language. But English here is also kind of like the baseline. You'd be able to speak to right. almost any South African in English and basic English anyone could understand here in South Africa. Um, if I could name a few of the lang languages, so we have English, we have Afrikaans, we have Zulu, we have Sutu, we have Tswana, which are um, very interesting languages because they are in widely spoken here in South Africa. Um, and I think what's interesting about us is that a lot of, like I said, a lot of people are multilingual. So um, even mm. if their home language is, is Zulu, they'll be able to speak to you in English or they'd be able to speak to you in Afrikaans as well. And Afrikaans is actually a subject that we learn at school. Not that I'm very good at it, but um, <laughs> it is something that we learn in school as well. You can also choose Zulu as a second language to learn at school, um, which I think is very cool. Um, that mm. irrespective of the cultural background you come from or the home language that you speak, you are included. And I think that's why we have the 11 official languages is that everyone is included. Irrespective of what language you speak, your language is an official language of the country. And it's that sense of in equality equality that we have amongst our people in South Africa is that every language is respected and valued equally. Beautiful. Uh, now, I normally start my interviews with this, Nazir, which is about pageants and your pageant history, but we delved into South Africa, which for me was a fascinating journey. As I said, I know almost nothing about South Africa. But to circle, full circle, um, and to talk about pageants, how you got into pageants, how big is the South African pageant industry? Because it's not big in Australia. It's not big in a lot of countries outside of the US and some other countries. So how did you get involved in pageantry and um, how big is the South African pageant industry? I think coming from the Philippines, I can definitely say that pageantry is not as big in South Africa as it is in the <laughs> Philippines. Um, yeah. Like I was, I was, um, I was amazed, I mean, visiting the Philippines because I think um, my fellow Earth sister, Margot Fargo, who represented South Africa the year before, um, we had a conversation about um, the Philippines and, you know, she was basically helping me prepare and get ready for the competition. And she was incredibly supportive and I'm so grateful for that. I, I distinctly remember her saying one thing to me. She said, you're going to go to the Philippines. You're going to get off the you're you're going to get off the, your flight, and you're going to arrive at the airport, and every single person is going to know who you are. You are going to feel like Brad Pitt the second you land in the Philippines, and it was such a weird experience and and such a humbling experience as well for people to just go absolutely nuts and so excited that you're there and that they're able to be with you. And then you come home back to South Africa and you get off your flight and you just like, uh, okay. And nobody, nobody even notices that you're there. So yeah. it definitely isn't as big in South Africa. I do think it is getting much bigger now, especially because we've had a lot of international wins, you know, with um, Miss Universe in Zozibini and Tunzi and with Demi Lee now, Peter's, um, we, it's definitely gained a lot of more attention and a lot of more mm. momentum, especially because we've had so many international wins recently, even with Rolene Strauss winning Miss World. So I think it is getting there, but it's not, it's definitely not as big um, in South Africa as it is in other parts of the world. Like you said, um, in Australia, it isn't, it isn't that big of a deal. Um, but it's getting there. I think it's definitely getting there. I think people are seeing that we have some amazing candidates who are representing South Africa all over the world, and it's time we start supporting them. So I have seen an increase in interest and support for pageants. 
um, in South Africa, but definitely not as big in, as it is in other parts of the world. Well, I don't think there are many countries that can compete specifically with the Philippines. Oh, definitely uh, not. It, it doesn't surprise me. I have this image of any one of the queens sort of deplaning in the Philippines and basically being mugged at the airport by mobs of adoring fans. And that's not that's not an exaggeration. You guys are no, literally it isn't. treated like not queens at all. in the Philippines and then to come back home and no one recognizes you must be quite of an odd experience to go from it was, it, hero to zero. It really was. I mean, initially it was such a culture shock to go there and um, thinking that I'm just this little girl from some part of Johannesburg at the southern tip of Africa and somebody knows who I am all the way in the Philippines. It was a really humbling experience. And um, I mean, the most amazing thing, I think it was with Matea and Susanna, and we were driving through a village in the Philippines and we saw groups of little girls screaming, South Africa, Canada, Australia, and waving our flags. <laughs> and it was most, it was the most incredible experience. I mean, we're from such different parts of the world and here these little girls are screaming our names, screaming our country's names and holding our flags. It was the most incredible and humbling experience, I think, either of us have ever had. I mean, Matea had a lot of adoring fans. I saw tons of, <laughs> of Canadian flags. We were just like, Matea, you're very famous in, in, in this particular village. There were so, so many Canadian flags in that, um, in that particular area. Wow. That, I can't imagine what that's like to come from any country and to go to the Philippines, which is quite far away from a lot of the countries, and to be recognized that, that, that's got to be an experience. Uh, but Nazia, how did you actually get involved in pageantry to begin with? Was this the first pageant you've competed in or have you competed in other ones um, previous to Miss Earth? Um, this is a question I get asked a lot. I think because the, the misconception is that I've entered a ton of pageants and then I've done a lot of pageants. Um, I've only done two pageants in, in my lifetime. Um, and how it actually came to be about is I've always been someone who is very active in the community, someone who's um, very active in different charitable causes or community projects. And that's something I was always very passionate about. Um, I actually grew up an athlete and I was an athlete for most of my life. I was a competitive swimmer. And a lot of people are like, okay, um, you can't be both. You can't be a tomboy and an athlete and a beauty queen at the same time. And that's where I come in and I'm like, but I'm both girls. I love to be athletic. I love to be outdoors. I love to be um, sporty, but I also love the glitz and the glam and getting all dressed up and being pretty as well. And I think that's what's made me a very well-rounded person is that I could mm. I could explore different parts of myself and be proud of different parts of myself. Um, so I would swim for a lot of uh, charitable causes and our swimming club, our community swimming club would host um, a lot of charitable projects and I would get involved with a lot of community charity projects. And um, I was introduced to a competition called Miss Teen Commonwealth South Africa. So I was 18 at the time and I heard about the competition and um, how the competition worked and what it stood for and how it was grooming young girls and all the different charitable causes you could get involved in. And that's what really excited me about it. I was definitely not as vocal um, and extroverted as I am now when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I think doing Miss Teen Commonwealth South Africa really groomed me and really molded me into the woman I am today, especially it being the first part or the, my first experience with pageantry, I found that I really grew a lot as a person. I got more comfortable with speaking in public, more comfortable within myself. Um, I was able to learn a lot of valuable business skills that really helped me put together my own charitable projects and my own charitable initiatives. Um, whereas you'd have to go to corporations or bigger businesses to find sponsorships to help fund your event or different things like that. Um, so being part of that journey was incredible. And learning to uh, 
um, doing all these courses and public speaking and learning just to be comfortable and confident in myself at that young age was very important to me. And that's what I'm so grateful for pageantry, which, it, which pageantry has taught me, is to really just be comfortable and confident in who you are and um, embrace who you are. And you get to learn all these different skills that I would have definitely not been able to learn anywhere else. Um, I still remember um, my mom was extremely supportive. This was like um, a dive into the deep end. It was something I'd never done before. It was my first pageant. I was kind of still figuring out my way around it and how I'm supposed to do this. My mom was incredibly supportive and was with me literally every step of the way. My mom would come with me to events. She would help me plan all my projects and my initiatives. She would come shopping with me. She would do everything with me. And I'm very grateful for that support. Um, it was a, it was really a dive into the deep end. My family, I mm. think they booked the entire first row of the theater. Like the one, <laughs> not, 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 just, not just in the front, like the, the seats like on the edge of the stage. So like right on the edge of the stage. So anywhere I looked, I would see them. Everyone was very excited about it. They were, they had booked out the entire first row and I was just enjoying the experience. I was, I was loving it. And I so remember standing in the back and just so proud of what I had achieved and so proud of um, the fact that I had gotten to the end of this journey and that I'd learned so much. And I don't even think I was listening. I think I was, I was like completely zoned <laughs> out. And then yeah. they were calling top five. And I think the, um, the host had called my name twice and I didn't hear and I could just see my family screaming <laughs> at me, it's you, it's you, it's you. And I was just like, oh, okay, no, are you, are you kidding? I was so surprised that I'd been called to the top five. And then after top five, they'd called my name and I'd won the competition. And it was just, <laughs> it, was an out, it was an out of body experience. I think, I think there is a picture somewhere of my reaction to all of this <laughs> happening because I was just, I was just so in awe and I wasn't, I really wasn't expecting to win. Um, but that was basically my, my start in pageantry. I started with Miss Teen Commonwealth South Africa and my reign was incredible. I did, I learned even more. I grew even more as a person. I got to do so many incredible um, projects and initiatives. And I actually met uh, Miss Earth South Africa 2014, Ilza Saunders during my during my reign as Miss Teen Commonwealth. And right. she's the most incredible um, person I've ever met. And I credit my entering into Miss, South, Miss Earth South Africa to her because we got into talking and she told me all about the organization and what they do and what they stand for and what Miss Earth as a whole stands yeah. for and represents. And that's kind of how I got into Miss Earth South Africa. And here I am today. And what's next in terms of pageant plans for yourself? Are you done for now? Do you have your eyes and heart set on a particular system or not sure at the moment? I mean, with COVID, it, it's all over the place, but what's next for you in pageant land? Um, so Miss Earth International was my very first international competition. So I, I didn't know what to expect from the experience. I was also kind of just finding my way around it. And um, sure. like Matea was, Matea was so supportive because she had been to an international before yeah. and she was so supportive and she was like, don't worry, I was exactly the same at my first international. And I mean, um, like Susanna, Matea and Nikki and Imani Davis, we, I met, they were the first girls I met at, at Miss Earth and we still have such a beautiful relationship now. And I was actually having the same conversation with them and I feel like I've learned so much from the international competition and having that experience of being at an international competition that I've learned and grown so much as a person and that pageantry has done so much for me and my self growth as a person that I definitely want to get into another pageant. Um, I think with COVID-19, it's definitely um, hindered a lot of uh, plans that everyone has had for the year. Uh, yeah. But an, a new pageant is definitely something I want to consider next year. I'm not sure which one is it, um, but definitely, I, I'm, I'm going to say definitely another competition for me. Right. 
I mean, I've got to say, you having been to the Philippines is probably a baptism by fire. I think if you can <laughs> survive that, then oh, yes, you'll be yeah, similar to Mateo. Sure. You'll be able to survive anything. I mean, I can't remember yeah. how many times Mateo has competed, but she's competed, I think, internationally at least twice. So yes, I can imagine she, she would be the, the voice of reason, the voice of experience, and she's a very cool, calm and collected character. Now, Giselle has oh, said... Oh, she is. Uh, she is. Yeah. Uh, Giselle here said South Africa has the highest free fall in the world. Have you tried things like bungee jumping or so with a teeth clenched emoji? Um, I am a very adventurous person. I haven't done bungee jumping, but I've done um, like the zip lines and the parasailing and jet skis and those kind of things. I haven't done bungee jumping as yet. And I'm not sure if I will be able to convince my mom that I'll survive because um, I'm a very, 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 very clumsy person. Um, my mom just looks okay. at me sometimes and she's just like, why? Like, how? How did this, how did this even happen? I think even at, um, even in the Philippines, at the international, I was in the Philippines for two days and um we were doing an eco walk to dinner. So instead of taking a bus or a train, we decided to walk to dinner. And yeah. of course, of all the people in the entire group, I would have to be the one person who has to trip on something on the floor that nobody saw and fall on my knees. <laughs> so, I mean, you'll even see in, um, in, my res in the resort way competition, I have a big old plaster on my knee because, I mean, I really wanted to take it off because it was a couple of days later and I know the, the Miss Earth team that was with me there, they were like, no, there's no way you're taking this off. It's still bleeding and it looks, it looks, it looks really painful. So I think you're going to have to just keep that, that plaster on. And I remember doing the show with my plaster and everything and Matea was the one who was with me when I was there and she was like, you know what? I'll just rock that plaster. Just forget it's there. It's fine. <laughs> and then I get, I, we get back to the, we get back to the our room after the after the resort way competition. And I get a call from my mom, and she's like, "What did you do? You had a big old plaster on your back, on your on your knee. What what happened to you? What did you do now?" So I'm a very very clumsy person. So I think. Convincing my mom that bungee jumping is a good idea is probably <laughs> going to take me some time. It um, it might not be the wisest choice if you are, no. let's say, uh, inclined to be a bit clumsy. That and and skydiving both are things where it's not it's not good to be clumsy. Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. And I'm I'm a, the biggest class. <laughs> I, I've met a lot of pageant girls who are clumsy, so I can assure you it's not just you. I interviewed um, our Miss Grand Australia back, not last year, but the year before. She got to the international competition, and I think it was a few days in, she managed to break her thumb. So the whole, basically, competition, oh my gosh. I think it was her thumb. She had her thumb in a, in a car, so basically everywhere she was going, she, she was like this. <laughs> was oh, no. the, so you're not alone. It's okay. I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad. I, there's, there's a whole support group of pageant sisters who are just as clumsy as I am. So I feel, I feel safer. I feel much safer now. Actually, that, that should be a Facebook group, a support group. It should. It, it should be a support group. Clumsy yes, pageant queens. I, I think that's needed. Um, tip, tips for how to, how to deal with all the little accidents that you're going to have. Uh, yeah. But... Nazia, before we go to the final 10 questions, we still haven't covered what you do for your career and um, what you do in your spare time, if you have any, because a lot of pageant girls don't. So for your career, what do you do? And then in terms of re relaxation, what do you do? Um, so I studied at the University of Witwatersrand, which is the main university here in Johannesburg. Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in media studies and international relations. And I also have an honors degree in media studies. I'm currently working at a law firm actually, which I'm really enjoying. It's very different for me. Um, I'm also a qualified swim teacher and first aider, which I was doing for quite a while. I was teaching um, swimming lessons once a week. 
Um, long term, I think my goal for long term in, in terms of where I'd like to be in terms of my career, mm -hmm. I would love to be a news anchor and work in um, the news industry. That's definitely something I see myself doing. Either that or some kind of presenting or something like that is definitely yeah. Um, what I see for myself um, in the future. Um, contrary to popular belief, I love being at home. Um, so whenever I have a chance to just relax, I think my favorite thing to wear is pajamas. So you'll see me at home <laughs> in pajamas watching Netflix. I mean, if it was socially acceptable to wear pajamas in public, I'm pretty sure I would be doing that. Um, my grandmother, my, gra my grandmother calls me pajama girl and she, uh, I mean, she got me pajamas for my birthday, and it was, I mean, it was the best. It was the best gift of all the gifts I got. It was just this very cute pair of pajamas. I love being at home, but I also love, um, I love the outdoors. I've always been someone who loves the outdoors. Um, so being outdoors is something that I really enjoy. Um, there's so much to see in South Africa, so I love exploring all the different yeah. outdoor activities that we have here in my free time. I love movies. Um, I love reading from time to time. I really enjoy that too. Um, being with friends and family is something that's very important to me. I grew up very close with family, so I'm a very family oriented person. So I love spending time with family. Um, um, we go on a lot of family holidays together as well within South Africa sometimes and when we have a chance overseas as well. Um, yeah. That basically summarizes me. I'm, I love being with people. I love getting involved with community initiatives and events. Um, wherever there's a charitable cause that needs assistance, I am there. Um, I serve as an ambassador for the Youth Managers Foundation. And we do an array, we have an array of partnership schools all around South Africa, basically mentoring kids to be the best versions of themselves and providing them with all the necessary tools and resources that they need to be the best versions of themselves and to really make a difference in their schools and in their environments around them. Because a lot of these kids are based in very disadvantaged areas in South Africa. So that's something that I really put a lot of my time and my energy into is um, really making a difference. I've always believed that um, it is our duty to give back um, as much as we possibly can if we are in a position to. And I mean, giving back is not just about contributing thousands and thousands of dollars or rands or anything like that. It's hmm. the most valuable thing you can give to someone is your time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify what you're wearing now, are these pajamas? Oh, uh, no, no, no. So this is no, okay. unfortunately not. I, I probably, I probably would have tried. I probably would have tried, <laughs> but um, I probably would have tried to wear pajamas and my mom would be scolding me in the background being like, no, there's no way that's happening. Um, but no, I'm wearing a jumpsuit, very traditionally South African. I thought it would be a good idea to wear kind of like a South African print, especially because we're celebrating Heritage Day, and mm. I'm so fortunate this um, beautiful jumpsuit was sponsored to me by Classic Fashions by D. Thank you so much if you're watching. It's absolutely stunning. Um, so, yeah, I chose a very South African heritage vibe outfit for today. If I could find a Heritage Day pajama, I probably would have tried. <laughs> well, it looks lovely. Um, I'm sure you're not the Thank only you. one who has spent way too much time in their pajamas in 2020. Again, I can oh, assure yeah. you, there are a lot of people around the world who have spent about 90% of their living days in pajamas in 2020. So, um, but I assume that your pajamas are much more fashionable than most people's, uh, my own included. Uh, Nazia, just before we go to the final 10, I like to give people a chance to do shout outs and thank yous. So in terms of people who supported you along your journey, pageant and otherwise, who are the main people that you'd like to give a shout out to or just say thank you to for their support? This is very a very difficult one because I'm very proud to come from my small community in Indonesia. And I honestly feel that with every initiative or every pageant that I've entered, it almost feels as if the entire community rallied behind me to support me. 
And I think I owe a lot of my success to the community of Indonesia. And if I can quickly, off the top of my head, um, shout out and give thanks to everyone who um, was part of my journey or helped me get to where I am, I first and foremost have to thank my mom. Um, I wouldn't be here without you, and um, I owe every bit of success of mine to you. It is only because of you, and I am because you are. Thank you, Mom, for everything you've ever done for me. Um, my sponsors at Wadi and Wadi Attorneys, Yusuf and Zenobia, thank you for your continued support for all my projects and initiatives in every single journey that I've decided to undertake. The Youth Managers Foundation team and all the kids um, thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for all that you do. Um, thank you to the Gandhi Walk organization who has support supported me from day one of my pageant journey, of my community, community involvement journey. They have supported me from the very beginning. Um, thank you to the Miss Earth South Africa organization. You have given me opportunities of a lifetime. And I am eternally grateful to be part of the Green Earth family. And I thank you for your love and support and for building me into the eco warrior that I am today. Um, thank you to the people of South Africa for always rallying behind me and showing all your love and support um, to my Earth sisters from around the world. Um, Matea, Susanna, Nikki, Imani, Nellis, Talisha, um, Jalen, Ali, Ria, Sarah, all of you, I'm and Fernanda, I miss you all so much. Thank you for always supporting me. All these girls are just a call away. Um, whenever I need them, they're always just a call away. They're incredibly supportive. And thank you for um, sharing the most incredible experience of a lifetime with me and helping me get through the difficult days. I think everyone, every, every, every pageant girl who has been through an international competition knows that it's the hardest and the best experience of your life. And it's really the queens that are by your side that really get you through the days when you've slept for two hours and um, your emotions are about down and um, you're missing home and your energy's a bit down. They are the, they are the people who really get you through everything. To um, Uncle Yunus Mita, thank you so much for everything you've done for me, for mentoring me and teaching me so much about our planet and how I can best serve the planet. To all my sponsors who have given me garments and um, jewelry and everything that I've ever needed. Uh, Fatih Ghani exclusive evening wear, who's always supported me um, from the beginning of my pageant career. Thank you for always supporting me. And to all the other brands who have supported me throughout my time as Miss Earth and Miss Teen Commonwealth South Africa. Um, thank you for all of that. Thank you to the people of South Africa and everyone around the world and the people of the Philippines for giving me the adventure of a lifetime and for showing me more love and appreciation than I have ever been able to see or I ever thought possible. Thank you for that. Thank you to everyone in the Philippines and thank you to Carousel Productions for having me part of the Miss Earth 2019 Um it has been the most incredible and life-changing experience. And it has introduced me to the best people from all around the world who I now have the opportunity to call my sisters. Thank you for all of that. Often people struggle with their thank yous because they always forget certain people. I think that is the most thorough thank you I've ever heard. So I hope that you haven't missed anyone out because I really, I, think... I really hope I haven't. And if I did, I'm, I, I sincerely apologize. But I, I mean, I think with every pageant goal, there's so many, um, there's so many different people and such a large amount of people that are standing behind you. And we wouldn't be where we are and who we are without all these people who help us in our journey or push us along our journey or assist our self growth. And that's very inspiring to see that if one girl decides that, you know what, I'm gonna stand up and I wanna do something different and I wanna make a change, that there's going to be an army of people behind her who are willing to support her. Absolutely. Okay, Nazia, let's wrap this up. The final 10 questions, I've done 
somewhere in the vicinity of 200 interviews, and I always wrap up the interview with the same 10 questions. It is not a speed round, although if you're okay. like Matea and you are ridiculously competitive, <laughs> you can try to answer them as quickly <laughs> as you want as well. So question one, what is your favorite word? My favorite word is power. And I think for me, this, this word is incredibly important to me as a person because growing up, um, I struggled a lot with bullying and things like that in school. And it would really affect my self-confidence and I would become extremely withdrawn. And something my mom would always tell me is believe in your power the power that God has given you, the power that is inside you. And she would make me do all these um, mirror exercises where she would have me stand in front of the mirror and she would say, she would have me say, you are powerful, you are beautiful, you are strong, you are resilient, you are intelligent. And she would have me repeat these mantras when my self-esteem was low and it would be um, very empowering to me. And being South African, the word power is very important to me because um, power in the wrong hands was mm. um, very much evident in my country. And giving power back to the people, giving power back to South Africans is really what brought us, uh, brought us out of the darkness and which um, allowed for our liberation. So I think that would be my favorite word. And what is your least favorite word? Failure. Um, failure would be my least favorite word, I think, because there's no such thing as failure. And I don't believe that there is anything. Um, there isn't, there, the failure doesn't exist to me. Because if you've, you haven't failed at something, you've learned a lesson. If you didn't mm. succeed at something, you've learned a valuable lesson. And um, I was listening to um, an interview Matea did, or I think it was a docu-series or something that Matea had done. And she spoke about this so eloquently. She said that um, we thrive in our adversity and that um, no growth is without pain and without mm. the sense of failure. You don't learn anything valuable from anything you've just done so well at. And I yeah. think for me, that's been, um, that's been the biggest lesson. Um, in my final year of high school, I struggled a lot with my health. And that started affecting my my grades or my marks at school. And I felt like a failure the entire time. And um, what really kind of led me in on the idea that I shouldn't be believing that failure is a real thing is during that experience, I struggled so much with my health. And it was so bad that to the point where I was very, very ill um, just a little bit before my final exams. And I was diagnosed with a condition called endometriosis, which is, um, which was, I mean, it was heartbreaking to me. Um, mm. And it made me feel like everything was holding me back from getting to where I wanted to be. And it took support from people around me. It took hard work and dedication. I mean, I was failing a lot of my subjects at that point. Um, because I'd missed so much of time out of school, going for surgery or treatments or being unwell. And it took a lot of hard work and determination um, for me to really succeed and ended up doing very well at the end of matric. I mean, it took, well, mm. we call our final year of school matric um, and doing very well at the end. And looking back upon my journey, those those times where I felt like I had failed, was really the time where I learned the most about myself as a person. It was really a time for an immense amount of growth for me as a human being. I realized and I learned how strong and resilient I can really be if I put my mind to something. So that's really where I learned to not believe that there is any such thing as a failure in the world. It's If you haven't succeeded at something, it was an opportunity to learn and grow and be better the next time. Question three, in life, what gets you excited or what turns you on? What gets me excited? Um, the prospect of new opportunities um, or, um, or a new purpose or a new way to make a difference, for example. Um, 
if there is an, a new opportunity or something that I need to get on board with, um, that's what makes me excited. If there's an opportunity for me to get involved, that is something that has always excited me or always motivated me. Um, last year, particularly, there was an incident where um, I spoke about it in my eco video very briefly. Um, mm. I assisted with the Flamingo Project. There was an incident at the Campus Dam in Kimberley where we have one of four breeding grounds for lesser flamingos in Africa. And the dam was very negatively affected. The, uh, the, the flamingos weren't able to get enough food and majority of the adult flamingos were leaving the area because of lack of access of food and things like that. And they were leaving their unhatched, um, unhatched baby flamingos behind. Mm. And what started to happen in the community was people started seeing these baby flamingos hatch over time and thousands upon thousands of them. And that's really when I saw an opportunity to really help because people of the mm. community started gathering the flamingos to put them in different rehabilitation centers all across South Africa. And there was a call to action for people to come and get involved to help provide either volunteering or um, helping provide the different types of foods and medications that these little baby flamingos um, needed. And that was something that really excited me. If there was an opportunity to help, there was an opportunity to make a difference. And I immediately jumped on board, um, deciding to host a fundraising hike for people to get involved and contribute their money so that we could help um, a rehabilitation center in my province provide um, food and medical care for the flamingos that they were allocated to look after. And I'm so proud to say that most of the flamingos that were taken were, have been reintroduced back into the dam, which is now in a much better condition. And oh, these wow. are the kind of things that get me excited. I mean, um, we were able to make such a great difference and conserve this amazing breed of flamingo that we are so blessed to have in our country. So that's definitely something that gets me excited. New opportunities, new ways to get involved, and new ways to make a difference really get me motivated. And what about what turns you off? What definitely turns me off is ignorance. And um, I've come across that a lot in my journey. Um, a lot of people saying, what is, what is ditching a plastic straw going to do um, for the environment? What is it, how is me choosing not to use a plastic straw going to do anything positively for the environment. Your whole advocacy is based on that. What is, what is the point of that? And I've had mm. a lot of backlash with things like that. And ignorance is something that can be extremely um, disheartening, especially when you're trying to advocate for um, a particular cause or get a certain message across. Um, but what I've learned over time is that ignorance can also be opportunity. It's a massive opportunity to educate. So as much as, um, especially with environmental issues, I think, people always say that, um, you know, why, why should we give any of our attention to environmental issues when the world has so many social and economic issues? And my answer is always that environment is linked to everything. If you have an environmental issue in a particular area, whether it be that the main water source of the people in that area is severely polluted because of our ill waste management habits. It then starts to cause health problems. And if it's in an area where people don't have quick access to health care or medical care, that becomes a social problem. So I believe that environment is linked to everything and that ignorance can sometimes mm. be, um, can a lot, a lot of the time be an opportunity to educate or maybe show people things um, they may not have seen before or educate people on maybe conditions or things that they may not have been able to see before. Absolutely. Question five, what sound or noise do you love? This is a difficult one. Um, natural sounds probably would be um, the sound of birds or flowing water. That would be something that I would absolutely love. It just relaxes me. And having been a competitive swimmer, water is just my element. So I love the, I love the sound <laughs> and the feel of water. Um, and definitely birds. Birds chirping is, is, the, is probably the best sound in terms of natural sounds. 
and uh, maybe not so natural sounds. I love music, so um, and I'm into all different kinds of music. There's not one particular genre that I can say I don't listen to. I have a very um, diverse array of music taste, so definitely music would be something, um, one of the things that I love to hear. What about what sound or noise do you hate? Ah, okay, this is an easy one. Um, <laughs> so this, it's gonna be a, bit, a little bit weird, but um, you know when a hanger falls on the floor, mm -hmm. like um, a hanger that you would use to hang up something in your in your house, it is the most annoying sound when it falls on the floor. It just, <laughs> it just, it just. I don't, I don't know. And uh, maybe it's just me. Maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's also a whole community of people who hate the sound. <laughs> but definitely, that would be one of the sounds that I I just I cannot stand. And I know a lot of people also don't like the sound of like a stainless steel um, knife or fork scraping on a plate. I hate the sound yeah. of that. That would be also one of the things I just, you know, yeah. just hurts my brain. The the knife on on plates or the fingers down chalkboard is very, very common. But I have to yes, say, yes. hangers falling on the floor. That's the first yeah. time I've heard that one. So that's very definitely I think, a unique answer. Yeah, I think it's because we have, I have wooden floors in my, in my bedroom. So when it falls, it makes the loudest, most aggravating <laughs> sound. So and it and ironically, the clumsy person I am, I drop the hangers all the time. So it's to my own detriment, I guess. Okay. All right. Question seven. If you could have any one superpower, what would you pick and why? Wow. This is a very difficult one. Um, one superpower. Um, I think I would love to have the ability to fly. I think for different reasons than other people might say. I think it's because a lot of people uh, would say they love to travel and they would love to see, uh, have the ability to go anywhere all around the world. Um, for me, um, this is particularly something I wish I had during the Australian bush bushfires particularly. I mean, I was looking for so many different ways to get involved and um, so many um, different organizations that I could help contribute to, to assist with the initiatives that were going on in Australia during that time. Mm. And I spoke to Susanna quite a bit um, during the time of the, of the bushfires. So particularly when there's anything um, disastrous happening in the world and I just feel so stuck and I can't get up yeah. and go and help or contribute positively in some way, I've always felt like, you know what, I wish I could just have wings and, and fly there and go and help in some way I could. Like for example, with the with the the explosion in Beirut, for example, I yeah. I mean I I I'm someone who just can't sit still. If I know I'm capable and able able to help in some way, I just I want to get involved and I want to do something. So I think I've definitely always in times like that wish that I had wings so I could just fly there immediately because flights and stuff are always usually complicated and or expensive or it's not possible, especially in areas that have been <laughs> struck moment. by natural, or especially areas that have been struck by natural disaster and isn't always easy to get there. So yeah, that's definitely, I would pick, I would definitely pick having wings. Question eight, what job or occupation other than your own would you most like to attempt? Um, I love animals. I've always been someone who enjoys nature and absolutely loves animals. But I always say sometimes I just love animals more than people. They just understand me in, in ways that people don't. <laughs> um, so I definitely think if I could do anything else other than what I'm doing or what I'd like to continue to do, I would try to be possibly a veterinarian. And what job would you definitely not like to attempt? Um, I've always been someone who's not very, uh, science inclined. It was never my, it was never my strong suit in school. So anything like engineering, things like that, I don't think I would ever be good at or ever want to attempt because science was never my, 
my strongest suit. I was always better at other, other subjects, but science was not my not my best suit. So I think engineering or something like that or something very mathematical wouldn't be good for me. I'm a very creative mind. So I think I wouldn't do well or wouldn't want to attempt any of those kind of um, occupations. Final question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It's by far the best question I think I've ever gotten. Um, Wow, this is a difficult one. Um, what would I like God to say? Um, I probably want God to say, your family is waiting for you. Um, I think that's always something that um, has always been close to me. I've always wanted to be close to my family and with my family. So if I was, if I was going to heaven, I don't think I'd want to be alone there. So I would want him to say that your family is waiting for you or they're all there. Just to be reunited with lost loved ones would be the most amazing thing. So I think that that would definitely be something I would want God to say. Well, Nazir, um, for our first South African interview, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was by far, I think, the most fun interview I've had in the longest time. So thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. It's certainly been one of the most eye-opening ones, uh, learning about a new country and one that I know so little about. And it certainly sounds fascinating um, in its diversity, with its culture, its people, and even with its food. I'm glad to see there are some similarities with Australia and South Africa. And obviously, you guys are, are huge into cricket and rugby as well. So, um, Yeah, I mean, I think in those ways, culturally, I think... Australia is very similar to us. We like similar things and we're mm. into very similar sports. So I could always relate to Australians very well. Um, and I, yeah. I watch a lot of Australian reality TV shows, actually. We get a lot of them here in <laughs> South Africa. Like, um, So I relate very well to, to Australians. Like we have, um, we, I watch um, My Kitchen Rules and uh, MasterChef <laughs> Australia and yeah. The Block Australia. Um, and the bachelorettes australia i mean i love i i love i love for things like this it's and the australian versions are always just so much more dramatic and as a south african <laughs> i get it i just i do okay. i get it i mean we're we're very similar we're very very similar people so i i really really enjoy it it's, it's a guilty pleasure i love australian reality tv it's really good. One of um, one of my very first interviewees and good friends, she's a international pageant competitor. She was in the most recent uh, recent season of The Bachelor, not The Bachelorette, but The Bachelor. And um, because she was in it, I had to watch it. And that was the first time I've actually watched reality TV. I did watch My Kitchen Rules, but um, yeah, it's the first time I've watched reality TV. So I'm yeah, glad to see that we've exported version. something to South Africa. <laughs> I mean, we've, we, have, uh, we have had a South African version of My Kitchen Rules. Um, a few se we had two seasons, I think. I could be mistaken. But um, I, I must say, I still, I still enjoy the, the Australian one. I, I do. I really enjoy it. I mean, I live for, I love, I love food. Um, so that's partly the reason I enjoy it. But it's, it's so yeah. dramatic. It's just so entertaining. It's such a step out from the normal. So it's, it's really, really enjoyable. <laughs> definitely, definitely a guilty pleasure. Um, well, Nazia, I'll keep you on the line for just a second whilst I hang up with the audience. Uh, but thanks to everyone for watching, whether it's live or on the replay and submitting your questions. And we will speak to you all next time.